Come closer. I want to talk to you. I'm going to tell you an astounding story. The story of the Maltese Falcon. For 600 years, the Falcon has carried the mystery of a fabulous wealth under its grotesque wings. I could tell you a thousand tales of the men and women who have hunted this evil bird. But every story has the same ending. Murder. Listen to these incredible people, all consumed by their passionate greed for the Maltese falcon. My name is Vivian Sobchak, and I'm a professor of film and media studies uh, and um, a historian, film historian and scholar. I became involved with the Falcon in 1991. This is the Maltese Falcon props for the film, uh, the 1941 John Huston film. Now, I was at the time, I was Dean of the Arts at UC Santa Cruz. I later moved to become Associate Dean at the School of Theater, Film, and Television at UCLA. I've been on the Board of Directors for 20 years uh, of the American Film Institute, and I'm also the author of many, many articles and books. Um, but the Maltese Falcon prop has been a particularly exciting um, object in my life, as well as in the life of many others. Um, along the way, and it's been a long, long saga, interrupted with all sorts of surprises, stalled and then picked up again. And we're going to explore one particular aspect of that um, in this particular interview with an extraordinarily interesting woman who also has attachments to the Falcon. Her name is Michelle Fortier, and uh, she is the daughter of Fred Sexton, an artist, and also a friend of John Huston's, who actually designed the Falcon prop for the film. This is very exciting for me, as well as I hope for viewers. Um, uh, can you tell us your connection, you know, to the Falcon? You were actually on the set, weren't you, at some yes, point? Yes, I was. I. Uh... My father, and as, as you mentioned, as, uh, and John Houston grew up together, and they were friends until they were old men. <laughs> and I was, uh, I don't know, I always kind of tagged along with my dad when he did things. He sculpted the falcon, and that was kind of exciting, and I was given a script to read, and I'd go to the set. How old were you around I was, this time? I was nine, because I was an only child. And probably because most of my parents' friends were artists, and and uh, there just weren't many children around. Mm -hmm. I, I never went to people's homes that had children, so I just went along. So I ended up going to parties at John Houston's house when there were all sorts of um, all sorts of wonderful people there. In fact, I remember making friends with it must have been somebody who was terribly bored by the party because he was Betty Davis's <laughs> husband and I think he was a doctor if I'm not mistaken it was one of her marriages and we discovered together that the drain around John's pool was full of little tiny frogs and we spent a whole evening <laughs> collecting frogs <laughs> <laughs> I went to all sorts of things but going to the set was wonderful and actually that was the first set I had gone to and had I known that we would be doing this interview, I would have spent a lot longer on the set. But uh, <laughs> Nothing like hindsight. <laughs> oh, nothing like hindsight. But when I got too bored and too antsy, I got to go out and play on the back lot, whether all the streets were Paris mm -hmm. or Antwerp or, you know. Right. So how long did you go to the set more than once, then? Oh, yes. I went to the set more than once. And uh, then I went later, I think the last set I was on was when I was in high school and he was doing Key Largo. Oh, so you, but, but in terms of the Maltese Falcon? Yeah, I think you, I, you, I think you, I did. I, the first time that I went was the exciting time because that was when I got to perch on Mr. Gutman, a.k.a. Sydney Green Street's Street. knee. And, uh, and Humphrey Bogart uh, teased me and scared me to death because there were signs that said, you know, and there were little red lights, and he convinced me that I had to be absolutely quiet. Um, 
And uh, so I, did, I just was like a mouse. I didn't make a sound. And then he yelled boo as loud as he could. <laughs> this was Bogart who yelled boo. Yes. Okay. <laughs> he seemed so to I, be having a good time yeah, with you. Yeah, so he was having a fun time. And, uh, I, and I saw him several times after that, mm-hmm. too. When but, you were there, particularly the first time you mentioned, um, did you see uh, any Falcon props? What, what were they shooting? Yeah, they were shooting. I, I don't remember exactly what they were shooting, but I remember they were they had the falcon problem and they were scraping it. You said you saw them scraping it? Yeah. Because yes. perhaps they were shooting the scene towards the, was Sydney Green Street scraping it? Do you remember? I, I, yeah, I think so. I, I remember he was there. Right, because um, yeah. there's certainly the end yeah. and Peter of the film, yeah, yeah, when they find out the falcon is, yeah. is not um, what they were expecting. But they don't necessarily do things in Mm-hmm. sequence either so if I went back another time it might be another right. scene they were picking up or- when you were on the set um and I'd like to talk about the you know the black bird um mm-hmm. was it in fact black yes it was <laughs> black it was shiny and, and black <laughs> and shiny and black yeah. uh and because there, there are there are other birds out there that are sort of um sort of reddish brown um, and of course there's the one that was made out of pure gold long after the film by Harry Winston uh, Jewelers and um, and this so forth but you remember a black yeah, this bird. Is shiny and and shiny when it was, it was it's not like patent leather shoes good not that good. shiny yeah, it was so uh, it shiny maybe not. gleaming maybe. gleaming or okay. glowing glowing yeah, I mean that would okay. be better that that okay. sounds about like the bird that I yeah. saw you yeah know, so yes. That's the um, word that I saw, too. Right. When your dad took you to the set, um, was he going for any particular purpose? Was he doing anything or just a guest? No, I think he was a guest. I think he and John, we all had lunch together, I think, that day. Or maybe we went home with mm-hmm. him that evening and had dinner. I don't remember. Right. Yeah. Now, um, do you remember anything um, about, you know, before, obviously, the shooting, the Blackbird had to be designed, oh, and okay. um, your dad was the artist who designed and and perhaps um, and modeled it in various ways. What what do you remember about that? But starting from the designing. Well, I remember. I, I don't actually remember seeing him draw this, but I remember the drawings, which were the original drawings, the preliminary sketches, were done on a Manila envelope which I had for quite a while, or uh-huh. it was at my mother's house. I have no idea what happened to it, but those were the first drawings, and I think then he and John must have discussed it mm-hmm. and you know, decided what it was exactly going to look like. But it was similar. It so was they worked similar. together on the design? Oh, you said, uh, you, no, I think he, you know, John wanted to approve it. Right, so of course. He'd have shown him the, mm-hmm. the pictures. And, and then he sculpted that. In and his studio. Uh, he, he actually sculpted a model. Do you remember mm-hmm. what he sculpted it Well, with I'm sure in? it must it have was... been terracotta. I think I might have, might have remembered if it was some other material, but everything he sculpted, he sculpted in terracotta, though occasionally in the gray clay rather than the... Great. Yeah, so the clay yeah. and, and yeah, yeah, rather than the it's, terracotta it's, clay you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the terracotta yeah. clay. Some is is a brownish right. orange, and some is a gray. Right. And so I don't know if it, that's called terracotta, mm-hmm. but it probably. Do you is. remember if it looked much like the yeah. bird in the film? Yeah. So it was yeah. that compact, sturdy, yeah. sturdy bird. Bird that uh, that with that fierce yeah. beak. Well, I don't remember it being fierce. <laughs> I remember it being <laughs> It probably was. It, it was reminded me a little bit of a book of uh, Egyptian art that we had. That's that's actually very interesting, um, yeah. uh, given given the shape it, it of wasn't, the bird. It wasn't. It didn't look like it, but it was. Uh, it, it was you had the same feeling. When right. You, Obviously, um, you know, you've seen uh, a very high resolution uh, photograph of. Um, a plaster Maltese falcon right. prop um, uh, that was used in the filming. Uh, that was sent to you um, by Hank Rison, the owner uh, of, of the prop. And uh, you understand that that has a, a number six on it. And there are also mm-hmm. some initials that were found on the tail feathers. Um, uh, which are sort of ambiguous if you don't know their initials because the S could be a five and the 
way that the F is there um, could be a seven, but you recognized oh, the initials right off. Yeah, not, that, not to me. It didn't look like a five or a seven. It looked like my father's Fs and Ss that he put on things. Can you explain a little about what that what that looks like? I mean, it, the way it looks that... a lot like my writing, actually. But he would make an F that looked like a seven to start with, and with a line across it, and uh, an and S. And when he was a very young man, uh, I think he was still in high school, probably. He went to work for a, a sign painter, and uh, he did some of the artwork, but he also did lettering. And his lettering was absolutely beautiful. And his signature is almost like lettering would be. Mm -hmm. it's, for it's signs, you mean. Yeah. 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 Because there is, in some in some cases, he has an F that looks like an F, although it's got the serifs yeah, on it. But never, and then yeah. also sometimes backwards, right? Like but a never seven. the capital F that we're taught up around and down and right, back. Right, right. It's, it's a very distinctive. Childhood. <laughs> very distinctive yeah, it signature. Is, it is very and easy, um, and I have some paintings. Uh, of his, where you can see it very clearly. Right. Well, that that's great because it, you know, his, his name has been put forward, um, you know, as as the designer of the Falcon. It wasn't there in the Warner Brothers archive. Just it was just a little note saying, you know, that it had been done for seventy five dollars <laughs> at the time, Amazing. but no name. Um, uh, and, and now then, it has a and, history. And, and now it has this, story this line that whole story. Um, in terms of the signature, which you recognize as your dad's on the um, uh, prop Falcon owned by uh, Hank Reeson, um, and you know, having looked at some of your father's paintings, some of the paintings have his signature the very uh, idiosyncratic, uh, you know, kind of printing. Um, but some aren't. Can can you address that as to why some are signed and some well, aren't? And some are studies that he did for, for larger paintings. And, and if somebody wanted to buy them, I'm sure he would have signed them. And, and some of them he would sign when they were going to be shown or when, you know, he didn't always sign them. And sometimes he signed them on the back. So you always have to check to right. see if they're there. And some of them he put in so discreetly, not to disturb the painting, uh, that you have to look for it. Okay. I have a, I have a, a, a still life of eucalyptus leaves, and you have to really look to see the And it's the on signature. one of the leaves? <laughs> I want to <laughs> hidden, it's hidden. Yeah. 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 Michelle, so. you know, you've, you've told us about your dad designing and, and the drawings, seeing the drawings, and of course on the set, the, the falcons and so forth. Do you know what happened to the model that he made? No, I, I, I guess I've just always assumed that John kept it. I might have been mm -hmm. at position, but I never saw it at the house. I mean, that doesn't mean it wasn't tucked away in a cupboard right. somewhere, but I mean, not displayed. Well, you did see the blackbird on the yes, set. Yes, I did. <laughs> I did. You said that, that your father and Houston had actually grown up together? Well, they went to high school together. Ah, oh, okay. They went to school together, and then they just always stayed in touch. When my father moved to Mexico, John had also moved to Mexico, so they saw one another. Wow. We are sitting in front of a whole assortment um, of uh, your father's paintings. Right. And uh, we're actually in a room, although we... We can't pan around. That's absolutely filled with his paintings. <laughs> it is a little overwhelming yes. even to me yes. just now because... <laughs> can, can you talk a little about his career? Yes, he, he was... A um, he started painting and drawing as a child, actually. And, and uh, he grew up in Auburn, California, and he said it was always... The, you know, it's Auburn because the soil is red. And he said it was the color of the soil that first got him interested in colors and... and that's good, uh, wonderful. And he used to draw all the time. And so when he got to school, he took a lot of art courses. And he never finished high school, but he read everything. He was probably the best read person I've ever known. You know, he was. And in fact, when I was small, and I don't know if the painting behind me with a little hat, uh, if, if you can see it, and one of the uh, things that he'd do to have me hold still when he was painting me was tell me stories from uh, Greek myths and mythology. And so I knew all about Zeus and 
and, and the horses with wings and the dragons and the manes, mm-hmm. and it was his way of keeping me, you know. And then, if you're very good, I'll tell you the next you know, <laughs> Sounds next like week. You know, <laughs> yeah. a thousand and one nights. Exactly, you know. exactly. Um, it was uh, very much as like, as uh, well as Greek mythology. Yeah. But uh, then he went on, uh, he married my mother, who he met at Art Students League. They were both artists, and they went to Europe together, and I was born in France. And they stayed there for a while, and then it seemed to get uncomfortable politically in the early 30s. So yes. uh, my mother came back to this country with me, and he went on to Italy because he loved Italian painting and Titian and Tintoretto, and he wanted to see everything he could while he was there. And he sold some paintings to a, a, a dowager countess, an Italian in Florence, and it was so exciting. It was one of his first big sales. And I remember when he'd have shows here, it would say, you know, you, you always have a, a catalog for the show, and it, it says in the collection of, and he, I, he always included her. You know, right, the countess. Kind of, right. Yeah. So then he came back to this country and continued to paint and uh, uh, reestablished his friendship with John. I mean, and then in the late 30s, they saw a great deal of one another. Did John buy any of his paintings? Oh, yes. John had some wonderful paintings of his. And, and John introduced him to Edward G. Robinson, who had a marvelous collection, almost all of European paintings. And the first two paintings of my dad's that he bought were the first two he purchased from an American painter. That's extraordinary. Yeah, he was. was quite a collector, yeah. Robinson. Yeah, oh, he yeah. was. And then he did a, a very large magnolia, a, a painting of magnolias that uh, Eddie bought too, and I, I remember going there as well. I, I had a lot of fun playgrounds when I was a child. There being they, Edward G. Robinson's Edward G. Home. Robinson's house had a gallery built on the side of the house because you could go from the house into the gallery, and he had all these wonderful paintings. And I could go because there was no one there. I could go and just look at everything, and then he opened it to art students and scholars and so on. A couple of mm-hmm. days a week, they could come on, make an appointment and come and see it. But it was great, and I remember he had a Degas ballerina with a slightly grungy shirt with skirt on. She was a little elderly, I guess, but I thought she was so gorgeous. And at the time, of course, <laughs> I wanted to be a ballerina before I knew I was going to be All much little too girls tall. wanted to be ballerinas. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Well, I, though I had an eye for fashion, too. I thought, you know, ballerina or perhaps a waitress or a nurse, because I liked their uniforms. They used to wear these That is quite caps. a range, <laughs> right. ballerina or a waitress. Um, I ended up nurse, working right. with computers, so, you know, what childhood <laughs> crushes mean. Right. Now, your father had a number of shows. Is he that had a correct? number of shows. He had a one-man show at the museum in Santa Barbara, a one-man show at the Palace of the Legion of Honor in uh, San Francisco. He had many one-man shows at galleries, uh, Stendhal galleries here, Corbusier in San Francisco. Gee, I can't remember mm-hmm. them all. And, and then he moved to Mexico, and he had a great success in Mexico City and had shows there in uh, Cuernavaca. Uh-huh. And, and he painted. So, and he, and I mean, he, he has continued a, painting. He yeah. didn't do a lot of sculpture. I think what did him in with the sculpture was... He was very interested in horses, and I guess I was about that age, and he took me riding and actually took me to an auction of old cavalry horses to see if we could find something. I don't know where he planned on keeping it. If yeah. you know. <laughs> but, uh, he decided he was going to do a horse, and it was beautiful. It was a gorgeous horse, and, but it was large, big, and it was hollow, and its legs wouldn't hold it, and they snapped, when oh. it was, I think, when it was baked. And so he... I think that may be the last thing he did. He did a number of busts of different mm-hmm. people for, you know, people's wives. But painting so was kind of, his real painting medium. Painting was his real love and his real medium. What's so interesting, you know, and in having looked at all these paintings, I mean, of course, we're looking at a very long painting career, right? Yes. Um, he painted until, until he was in, in his late 80s. Okay, because the styles, um, uh, they they all owe something and you know, to various different movements in, in, in painting from classical to modern, yeah. um, uh, you know, art and but so forth. But they were always his. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. you can, he, he did, I think he was a great painter. Mm-hmm. I loved his brushwork and I, I loved his color yes, sense. He does have very wonderful color sense yeah. and, and so on. I think one of my sons inherited it. There's a painting of his in the dining room. And oh, so he paints also, yes. your son. All right. Well, 
Uh, thank you very, very much. It's been a total delight talking to you, and, uh, and what an exciting story. You know, I've particularly, really enjoyed it. It's yeah, been For fun. film scholars and, <laughs> and um, for fans of the many different kinds of fans of the Maltese Falcon itself. So thanks. Thank you.